So hi, everyone. My name is Mara Gittleman. I am the workshops and education coordinator for NYC Parks Green Thumb. We are the part of the New York City Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. And we're so thrilled to be here tonight with so many amazing seed keepers. So thank you so much to Owen and Amira and Lex and Jeremy for joining us tonight. Really thrilled for tonight's panel. Um, we are recording tonight's session and we'll make it available on our website and YouTube. And we will have the video focused on our speakers tonight. However, you can decide whether or not your camera is on using the little camcorder icon at the bottom of your screen. And we're gonna use the chat for all questions. And so if you have any questions throughout the panel, you can put them there. I will hold on to them and until it's time for Q&A. And I think that's it for me. So um, we're really thrilled to be here with Owen from True Love Seeds. He's a longtime partner of community gardens across New York City, currently in Pennsylvania. And we're excited that we get to continue this partnership with you, Owen. So thank you so much for moderating tonight. I give you the mic. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, hi, everyone. Again, I'm Owen Taylor from True Love Seeds. It's great to be here. Um, as the second, this is the second part of the three-part series on seed keeping. Um, and I'm so excited for this panel. Um, you know, I get to work with Amira, Lex, and Jeremy in different capacities through our seed keeping kind of ecosystem. Um, and it's just cool that we get to have this public conversation um, about what we're doing in our communities and together. So thanks for this forum, um, Green Thumb and Mara. Uh, I wanted to just introduce myself a little more quickly before I open it up to the panelists. Um, I, as, as Mara said, I worked for many years, for seven years in New York City with community gardens through my work with Just Food uh, and the training of trainers and the City Chicken Project. And um, it's, just, it's just really great to still be connected to that. And through that work, you know, which was rooted in food justice and really lifting up the work and the voices of the long-term community gardeners of New York City and getting to be mentored by, you know, amazing people throughout the five boroughs, uh, like, you know, people like Abu Talib and Yannette Fleming and Karen Washington and countless others who took me under their wing, I, I always want to make sure that I'm, you know, staying true to what I've learned from them and those connections and giving back. And so True Love Seeds really was founded in the spirit of the food justice movement and in the spirit of kind of um, recognizing the work of those amazing folks who are rooted in community, doing the work to heal their communities through producing food, but also working towards justice. Uh, and so we work with urban and rural farms committed to social justice, food sovereignty, cultural preservation, and sustainable agriculture. Uh, if you look at the growers for our seed catalog, you'll see that many of them look familiar and some of them are even in New York City, like East New York Farms that Jeremy is uh, representing today. Uh, and so, you know, our work as a seed company as an, and as a seed keeping organization is to lift up that important work and support those farmers through the seed sales uh, and our website. Um, you know, to get to this point, I, I mentored under William Moyes Weaver, uh, who has a huge private seed collection and outside of Philadelphia. Uh, for four years, I worked with him and learned the art and science of seed keeping. And I wanted to bring it back to the community work that I'd been a part of. Uh, up until that point, and that is how kind of true love started. Um, and so simultaneously learning from seed keepers like uh, the Seed Keepers Collective, which was started by Brother Blaine Snipstall in Maryland, uh, you know, where we really focused on this whole concept of keeping not just the seeds, but keeping the culture, the rituals, the stories, uh, you know, the histories that come along with those. Um, and so that's kind of fueled our work with seeds in community. Um, and is how I met Amira, Lex, and Jeremy is through that, through that work. So I wanna open the, the floor to them um, to tell us about their work, uh, basically giving an overview of what does their work with seed keeping and community look like? And specifically, what does it look like on a day-to-day -day 
on the ground kind of tangible, you know, basis. Um, so I'm going to start with Amira Mitchell. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name again is Amira Mitchell. I am the seed keeping resident at Greens Grow, um, which is a nonprofit farm and garden center in Philadelphia. Um, and so as the seed keeper in residence, I'm running the uh, 2021 seed keeping fellowship program at Greens Grow this year, um, in which I um, we're working with a, about nine community members who are um, in this program to learn about the basics of seed keeping um, with a particular focus on their own cultural crops. Um, and so I am part, uh, part farmer and part educator in the program um, in that role of, of helping to mentor and, and teach people the ins and outs of seed keeping and helping them to explore seed keeping in their own ways um, through their own artistic outlets. Um, and, it, and it's a real privilege. And I also work with True Love Seeds with Owen, of course, who was my, is my seed keeping mentor and mm -hmm. um, who I've worked with for the last uh, three or so years. Awesome. Uh, let's go to Jeremy next. Thank you, Amir. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jeremy Tepperman and I am the farm manager for the UCC Youth Farm, which is one of the main farm sites um, run by East New York Farms here in Brooklyn. Um, if anyone is unfamiliar with East New York Farms, it's a program of a larger nonprofit called United Community Centers and the program has been around since 1998 um, and it grew out of the vibrant network of community gardeners that already existed in East New York prior to East New York Farms being a program. Um, and I've been there for about three years now. And um, my former supervisor, David Hill, who ran the project for a number of years, taught me a lot of what I know about seed saving. Him and Owen, I think, have been the two people that have taught me the most about seed saving. Um, and I inherited a lot of seeds from what David had collected and preserved over the years that he was there. Um, many of which came from gardeners around the neighborhood who had given David seeds um, for things like seasoning peppers and hot peppers and squash and other things from Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, etc. Um, so yeah, East New York is um, has a really thriving Caribbean population, um, Caribbean diasporic population. Um, so we try to grow, we grow some typical vegetables you'd see at any farmer's market or any community garden, but we really try to focus on vegetables and herbs that um, folks from the Caribbean really love. So things like bitter melon, long beans, callaloo, out and seasoning peppers, okra, and others, um, pigeon peas. So our seed saving efforts um, are sort of twofold. One is that, um, a lot, some of the crops that we grow, it's hard to find seeds for them in catalogs. So like, I had never heard of what a seasoning pepper actually before working at East New York Farms. Um, and, you know, the names that they have, you know, that uh, we have for them are things like Grenada yellow seasoning pepper, Grenada red seasoning pepper, just like very, just descriptive, you know, not scientific, not any specific, even common name, just a name that describes what the pepper is, where it's from, and, and what it looks like. Um, so we save those seeds just so that we can grow them again the next year and, and not have to worry about looking for new sources of them. Um, and then we also grow several uh, seed crops for True Love. Um, so we right now we're growing, we started with Kalaloo and Long Beans, and then a couple of years ago we started growing Pigeon Peas for True Love, and then last year along with Red Hook Farms, we started growing um, a spiky bitter melon variety that we've been growing on the farm for many years, as far as I know. Yeah, um, that's basically the, the gist of it. Um, we try to, I try to um, share as many of the seeds as I can with people. And it's been kind of cool because some crops that might not be specific to, to the communities within East New York, um, I'll find that gardeners are really curious and want to grow things even if they're not familiar with them. So I had gotten these seeds for this uh, dry bean called tiger's eye beans and 
a fellow gardener that has beds next to mine at another garden in East New York saw them and really wanted them. So the other day I gave him a bunch, even though it's not like a Caribbean crop. So that's one thing that I would I'd like to bring up is just that um, even a big part of what we do is obviously preserving seeds of Caribbean crops, but also um, just sharing seeds that might be unfamiliar, but um, beneficial or that people might be interested in learning more about. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks y'all. <laughs> Oh, and just a quick note, um, we're getting some feedback from your speakerphone. So I'm gonna ask you to mute when, um, after you're done asking a question. Sounds good. You're just gonna see my big finger each time. Um, so Lex, let's go to you next. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. Um, hi everybody, I'm Lex, uh, she and her pronouns. I am in Brooklyn, Crown Heights. Um, I am part of a project called Reclaim Seed NYC, which is a seed library, first and foremost, um, based here in Brooklyn and Queens. Um, it is a seed library. We also have a teaching garden and a kind of nebulous community archive um, as well. Um, but uh, the project was founded in 2019 by Jackie Pilati, who couldn't be here tonight, but is like definitely one of my biggest teachers and I know is also a teacher for all of the four of us um, and has definitely, yeah, has really put her heart and soul into, into this library and I'm so grateful for, for that. Um, so as I said, it's a seed library, right? So we um, are a community resource that um, shares seeds and we um, have a seed library that we maintain that is made up mostly of um, seeds that are really grown by us and like definitely the three other people that you see on the call and um, lots of other people as well in community, really just people who are growing seeds that are important to them and sharing and exchanging them. Um, we also do receive some donations from seed companies as well, like True Love among others. Um, but uh, the majority of what we really what we really work to focus on is yes, getting more, um, more seeds out to more people and in general reconnecting people with our seeds across the board um, and teaching those skills as well of seed saving and, and what it means and, and all the different components, um, but also really focus on, you know, the seeds and the seeds and the plants of our own cultures and the people who we are around in community within New York City. Jackie and I are both born and raised New Yorkers. Um, and have a really deep love for this city and all of the like many, many, many peoples of us that are here. Um, but we also, you know, Jackie is Puerto Rican, Italian, myself being black and Jewish, we really focus on our seeds mostly there. Um, but we have so many seeds to share. And the thing that I always say is like, people really come to seed exchanges and they're super timid. And I'm like, please, like, do you understand this abundance? Like, the point of the seed library is to create a community resource um, that is actually in motion, right? We want the seeds to be traveling between people. We want people to be exchanging them. We want them to be moving around and we want them to be planted, right? We don't wanna have a static box or a collection of jars that just like sits away forever. We actually need in order for these seeds to be reconnecting with people and to be um, also feeding people well and, and with all of the right adaptation and all of that other stuff that we can get into, um, we need the seeds to be in circulation. And so, yeah, it is really important for us to be putting the seeds back in the hands of community, to also be collecting and gathering all of the stories um, of our people and how they got there, how they got to us, how they moved through us um, and really sharing sharing in them, you know, the point is to create a shared resource and and we can also at some point, I don't know if our conversation will go there, but you know, talk about the seed industry and the seed and the seed privatization and, and what a thing like a seed library um, or even a seed exchange, um, which we host as often as we can, but at least once a year, um, you know, does to, to really move these seeds in community and kind of reclaim the power that communities can have when they are connected to their seeds and therefore to each other. Um, so that's really important to us as well. Um, and yeah, day to day, I guess I would say, because I think that is part of your question, Ellen. Um, you know, like I, like I said, we host seed exchanges. Um, those are not day to day, but those happen. Um, and we, we recently held one actually like last weekend. 
Um, that was really, really sweet. It was that day that it was really, really hot on Sunday, like a weekend ago, and it was like 80 degrees. I think y'all probably remember when it got really hot. That's the day we had the seed exchange. Um, in the winter, in the fall and winter, we'll, we will be and usually are doing workshops on seed saving. Um, so we can talk more about that as well in terms of opportunities to get involved. And the, the very day to day is really just like being a source of seeds when we can have open seed library hours where people come um, and exchange seeds or receive seeds. Um, and also just as people ask us. Um, and then of course the day to day is also growing what we can um and saving the seeds that you know that are important to us and and then like talking to other people about the seeds they're saving and figuring out how we can do more together and share more together so i'll leave it there for now nice thanks lex um before you got into the day-to-day -day, i feel like you really were leading us into this kind of question of what is our deeper kind of relationship to seeds and what do we want to see in terms of people's relationships to seeds in general? Um, like, why are we doing this work? Why are we seed keepers? Why are we, why is this our, our passion? Um, and so I wonder if you could just go a little deeper because you were headed that way anyway. Maybe we can go in backwards order this time um, and just hear a little bit more like why, why seed keeping? Um, uh, so go, go ahead, Lex. Okay, um, sure. Um, I might, I might like say a little bit and then might need to say more later, but whatever, let's just go for it. Um, yeah, why is he keeping? Um, so I think there's, there's many levels for me. I'll just start personally. Um, you know, the seeds are our ancestors. The seeds connect us to our ancestors. The seeds have like given me so much healing and abundance personally ever since I started working with and like intentionally learning from them. Um, and, you know, the reason that we hold a seed in our hand now is because our ancestors made like very intentional choices for that seed to continue and for us to be able to hold that now. And so it connects us to them in these ways that are just like incomparable and hard to describe. Um, and also that are so, needed for so many of us, particularly as painful as it is to return to relationships with the land, some of us, and and so like is almost as healing as a part of that process. Um, I can definitely say that for myself. Um, but yeah, on the community level, um, you know, I think also like, as I said earlier, like as we are reconnected to our seeds, we're reconnected with each other. It's like not really possible to be in isolation and like learn what you need to learn about how to grow a seed or like why it's important or how to cook it or how to eat it like you have to be in community to be sharing in all of that um and so it it itself is community building um which is really important to me and i think that as i also deepen my relationship with the seeds that that is true with other people um and i think one of the other things i'll say is you know like like I said before, um, the seed industry is really central to the agriculture industry, right? Like the privatization of seed in particular and the way that that has happened over time and the way that the state has had a role in that and then these mega corporations have as well is it impacts so much else. It impacts so much beyond that, right? This like commodification of life. Um, and then the ways that internationally across the globe, um, you know, people have been intentionally disconnected from their seeds as a means of like colonial exploitation. Um, so, so when we, you know, when we choose um, to, to hold seeds in community, which is actually illegal in a lot of places, and I know that, oh, and you can tell stories about that. Um, when we choose to do that, um, it's really on purpose um, towards, you know, a world where we actually believe that not only can we do that, but we have to. Um, not only like, do we have the right, um, but this is actually, it's actually beyond a right, it's a birthright. Um, and so there's something, you know, there's something about um, learning from these amazing ancestral teachers that also bring us together. And I, I will say for the seed library, um, 
Yeah, for the seed library, there's also this a component of economy um, that I think is really important, which is that a lot of farmers are so dependent on seed companies because of this whole history of all, all of the stuff around around seeds and agriculture. Um, and we're not there yet, but you know, we'd love to imagine that the seed li seed library can get to a place where like people can actually rely on this to feed themselves and their people and the people that they need to grow food for. Um, so that we don't have to be as dependent on these other sources of seed or food or whatever. And also that farmers aren't as like worried and scared about what happens if I don't, if I'm not able to grow this or if I'm not, if I don't get this production or whatever. So um, yeah, there's something about kind of creating this like shared economy of this main resource that we need, which is the seed. Um, and and uh, really centering kind of our economies around sharing that. So that's where I'll start. Jeremy, you're, you're next. Thank you, Lex. I have nothing to add. <laughs> um, Lex, you're so inspiring. Thank you so much for what you shared. Um, yeah, I, oh my gosh. So much of what Lex um, shared resonated with me so deeply and was put so eloquently. I guess, what would I add? I had the thought the other day, I mean, this kind of sums it up for me. Like I, I had the thought the other day that, you know, I, I keep all of the seeds that I've saved at my job. Um, and I thought, you know, just, I sort of wear my East New York Farms hat, but like without the East New York Farms hat, I'm also just me as a person who, you know, someday will probably do other things too. Or even if I were to stay, you know, working at this farm for my whole career, like I'm, I still have my own sort of personal um, and like community ideas about seed. And I was thinking, you know, I should, I should have seeds that I keep with me as like some of my precious belongings, right? Like what's more important than that? And as soon as I had that thought, my second thought was, that's kind of silly. Like, where would I keep them? What would I do with them? What am I going to like put them in my sock drawer, you know? And then the thought after that was like, yes, that's exactly what I would do with them. I would keep them, you know, in my drawer, in my bedroom, you know, because this is truly like, so it's hard to compare them even to any other possession. It's not like our clothing or our computer or phone or our books, even like, it's not like anything else that we own we don't even really own them it's just it's something that's part of life that I think that everyone should I think everyone should have a relationship with seeds everyone it would make sense to me in an ideal world that everyone would have seeds that they've grown or that they've inherited or that they were given and that they use and give away um yeah so I guess what I'm saying is that um like for me seed seed keeping is so central to food sovereignty right like we have to be able to um have the power to to grow our own seeds and to be able to adapt them to the climate that we're in and to change um over time with them like there's nothing for me like more central than what we put into our bodies and i've been learning more and more or you know becoming more interested in how Food, how central food and the food choices we make are to our health, how so much of our mental, physical health comes from, I mean, and it, it sounds obvious because of course we were all raised to eat our vegetables, but it's just so much deeper than that. Um, sorry, Alex, you really did leave me a little bit speechless. So I'm gonna leave it there for now, <laughs> but yeah, Amira, <laughs> please chime in. Sure. Um, and I, I do completely agree with you, Jeremy, that, that Lex, uh, your, your words took my breath away. Um, I, want to, I want to answer the question um, by starting out with, with the, the way that the, the Greens Grow Sea Keeping Program, the way that we first started thinking about it and imagining it, um, because it came as a result of two two ideas, um, two things that I felt were happening in the world. Um, and one of them, um, just this 
really obvious pandemic that we had. And in, you know, during that, that time, um, when people went into lockdown, I think there was this awareness when people started to realize that the food that we eat comes from somewhere. Um, and it's, uh, uh, upon ourselves to, to feed ourselves and to feed our own communities. Um, and there was this uh, panic, uh, this idea of shortage that people started to respond to by wanting to grow their own food. And when that happened, you know, all the seed companies were really hit hard at True Love. We were hit really hard with all these people who were interested in gardening in some cases for the very first time. So there's this massive demand for seed as people were coming into the realization of the importance of feeding ourselves and our communities. And at the same time, I, I was also getting this sense from, from the state of the world, from the state of my own heart, that it wasn't just any seeds that people were seeking. Right, we were all feeling um, this real uh, inner turmoil. I think a lot of us were, I guess to speak for myself, we're having this moment where we were looking it within ourselves and feeling a lot of hurt and pain and trauma that was coming up um, and needing a way to deal with that. And so when those two things collided, I felt that people didn't want just any seeds. They wanted connection, cultural connection, ancestral connection, community connection. And that's where I come in my seed keeping journey. That's where I come from. Seed keeping for me has always been about my ancestral connection, the connection to my ancestors, um, particularly my ancestors from West Africa, um, and being able to, to connect with those who came before me and to help heal myself and my family line from all the trauma that we've lived through and reclaim the best parts of ourselves for ourselves. And so that, that's what sea keeping has always been about for me from the very start has been about um, making that connection. And the work that I've done in sea keeping um, as, as Lex said, it's been incredibly healing. And I wanted other people to be able to experience that healing, that they could have these seeds, that they could find their people. Um, they could talk to their elders. They could re-examine their food ways and their cultural food ways and find, that, find these treasures from their past, from their future, um, and be able to engage with, with growing and sea keeping this way, I really wanted that for our community, um, especially at this time when it seemed that so many people were in need of this. Um, and so there's so many good reasons to be a seed keeper. Um, but you know, the, the people who, who answered the call when we, when we asked for uh, applicants for the fellowship program, I spoke with all of, of them. Um, I interviewed everyone and just the, the theme over and over and over again was the same, the same feeling of people wanting to reconnect, people wanting to really have a deeper understanding of who they were through their food traditions, their seed traditions, of really wanting to connect with pieces of themselves that they felt that they lost or, or um, pieces of themselves which perhaps they never lost but can't fully express in the culture that we have to exist in, right? Um, and so in every single one of those conversations with the sea keepers that I had, um, we, we talked a lot about cultural connection, ancestral connection, and, and many of them are all on different, um, parts of their journey. Some of them are, are just, uh, are just awakening to this, to this idea of sea keeping as a practice of, of self-reclamation and ancestral connection. And some people have been thinking about this and, and wanting to do more with it for years. And so I see myself in that journey. Um, and just as I ha have been able to find parts of myself in the seeds, um, that's what I hope for, for everyone else. That's beautiful. All, all of those were beautiful. Don't, don't sell yourself short, Jeremy. Um, I feel like even what you shared got me thinking about my house and my sock doors and the seeds that I've kept and lost. And I think these are all important pieces of the, of the story. And uh, Amira, I mean, we're so aligned in our, our work. I was compelled to share about 
how we work with ancestral seeds, but you've really said it all in what you just said. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, Jeremy, as you spoke about my house full of seeds and how my partner, uh, Chris, calls me every day like, where's this, where's that? And I have to explain the corner of the basement it's in or which bag it's in. Um, and I was like thinking about how I sometimes lose seeds some years. And I was like, but I always keep my cultural seeds because they're my cultural seeds and they're so important to me. And then I remembered that I lost my lumber potato collection this year, um, which has become a touchstone for my Irish ancestors and the specific lineage that I know about from Galway, Ireland. Um, and when you lose that lineage, that seed, and I can't, my mentor gave it to me and he lost it too, and I have to track down someone that has it now, um, you, it's not just any old seed, you know, it's, it's that every year I plant that and I harvest that and I think about that, that particular great grandmother and that story of my, you know, people coming from that particular village. Um, and now that's not happening this year, you know, and so it's a big loss. Um, it's, that's, that's what I think makes the work that we're doing so important. A lot of our own personal stories it, it wrapped up in these seeds are so powerful. And now all of us are also working in community with people who are also stewarding their ancestral seeds. Um, so I feel like that illustrates the importance of it when you lose it, you know. <laughs> of course, when you have it, it's very powerful. And then when you lose it, you realize how, how what you're missing. Um, so I have to find that potato again somehow. But I wanted to kind of segue with that into how, you know, I know that each of you have very powerful stories with your seed keeping um, personally, but I'm, since we're in a community context, I, I'm curious if you could share a story of how your community work with seeds has allowed people to kind of make that connection. And the connection you were just describing, Amira, but with an example, you know, like give us an example of a seed that we're kind of stewarding um, through our community work or, or, or some example of reconnection that has happened um, through our work. So I guess I'll leave it to you who, who's, who wants to go first. Maybe I'll just call on Jeremy, you're unmuted. <laughs> um. Well, there's one, I hope this answers your question, Owen. Um, there's one seed that I'm excited about that I know I've talked to you about, Owen, before, which is, I don't even have a good name for it, but it, it's basically a, a winter squash that I think is a kind of unintentional cross between a butternut squash and a Jamaican pumpkin or calabaza. Um, and basically, there is a... A husband and wife, um, Dennis and Marlene Wilkes, who live in East New York, just, you know, across the street from the farm that I manage and have been living there for decades. And they're from Jamaica and they go back to Jamaica multiple times a year. And, you know, they raise their kids in East New York and they've been gardening there forever. And they're some of the most dedicated uh, market vendors that we have. So some of our vendors in East New York are actually community gardeners that grow food for the market. And a lot of the community gardeners will just drop off their produce and leave and we sell it for them. But Dennis and Marlene actually sit at the market and sell their produce and are there for all six hours every Saturday. And the end of 2018, they had a very cute little, what looked like a butternut squash. It, you know, it had this size and shape and color of a, of a butternut. And I bought it and I roasted and ate it with my friends later that week. And it was one of the most delicious winter squashes I had tasted. And I was so impressed. So I saved the seeds for it. And I told Marlene I was going to, and then I grew them the next year. And to my great surprise, what I grew wasn't a crop of butternut squashes, but a crop of, you know, a few hundred squashes that had all different shapes, sizes, and colors. And I actually have a photo of Lex holding one that's like two feet long. <laughs> it's this extremely long crook neck and it's sort of um, like green, like dark and light green speckled. It's very interesting. So um, I think of what happens, since they're the same species, the two varieties, I think that 
Dennis and Marlene must have grown both and that they just crossed. And so I've grown it for two years now and have a bunch of seeds saved. And I'm trying to see if it can sort of stabilize into one variety or if it'll just continue being a big kind of very variation in, in size and shape. But it's just produced like the most amazing crop of squashes that are so tasty and, and, our, event, and our customers have really loved them. So it's been really nice because I know that um, prior to my growing that, we didn't really grow winter squashes in the farm. So it's been really nice to add that. Um, and yeah, and I'm hoping to be able to share those seeds with more gardeners and maybe even to be able to offer it through True Love someday if we can get it to, you know, a good variety. But that's just, um, that was a really gratifying experience for me just because it's like, it was really just an experiment. Um, and it just spoke to how, in certain ways, how easy and natural seed saving is. Like I just bought a squash from Marlene, saved the seeds and planted them the next year without any real thought or science or, you know, or uh, method to it. And what it's turned out to be so great, you know? So, yeah. Um, Lex, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, this is a great question. Um, it's interesting for a seed, it's interesting for a seed library because even though Jackie and I have like specific certain things that we like really focus on, um, we have so many things. Um, and so there's a lot of like points of possible connection and like all kinds of things. And the other thing about a seed library, which is actually ideal, right, is more and more we're trying to have it be more and more decentralized, right, because we like, we don't need to hold on to the seeds, we're not trying to, we want them to be out there. And so there's connections likely that we don't even know about, you know, that have happened because the seeds get passed on. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, one example I'll share is just like the seed exchange. Um, the table at the seed exchange is like one of my favorite places in the world, wherever the seed exchange table is, like that table, the energy at the table. Um, and I think it's because we had like seeds are so abundant. And so people come to the table and they're like meeting seeds and they're like, what on earth? There's like 50 million plants on this table, like beyond anything that we could even understand. Um, and like, that's just really like exciting and nourishing, but also so people are just generally reconnecting with that as a thing. Um, but also, um, even though we often have so much variety, the we don't always have everything. Sometimes people will come and be like, I do have this specific thing. And I'm like, I don't, but I definitely like know someone who probably does or someone else at the table does or knows someone who does. And so the thing that's really cool about the seed exchange is that the needs always get met. There's like never a, in, an impossible way for us to like, you know, it's never impossible for us to like get someone the seed that they need or like figure out someone who does and like just really in all of those connections and webs that I really love. Um, and actually uh, at the seed exchange we had, we had some peppers that were grown by Jeremy and folks um, at the UCC Youth Farm and someone came um, this woman came uh, and she was like, I'm looking for peppers or whatever. And those are the first peppers I showed because um, we had like a couple, I don't know, Jackie dropped me off a couple of different ones from y'all. And um, and she like saw that one of them was from Grenada and she like looked at it and she was like, oh my God. She was like, no way, no way. And she like, she just opened it and she smelled inside. And she was like, this is it. And then she like told this whole story about this pepper, whatever. So I have this person's information. I actually need to connect her with y'all, Jeremy, because she's super excited and wants to meet the real pepper. Um, but those, you know, like she just smelled it and she knew. Um, so the ways that we can reconnect people with like those memories and stuff, but also like for us as a seed library, like we're mostly a point of, we're like a mid, a middle, you know, it's like cool to be able to be like, yeah, like we know where this came from and we can, you can meet them and you can go there. Um, you can not just hold this seed, um, but you can actually go there and you can meet this pepper um, that you haven't met in like 20 years. Um, and then also another thing that I'll say, like, I'm, I'm very guilty of this and talking to all y'all community gardeners on the call. Um, one of the things that I do in the fall 
is I just like walk around and I look at the community gardens and there's usually lots of seeds growing that nobody is harvesting. Um, and so if someone's around, I'll be like, hey, like I don't take anything without asking, but if someone is around, I'll be like, yo, is anyone gonna harvest all of this seed or all of that seed or whatever? Cause if not, I'll harvest it and then we'll share it with people through the seed library. And usually they're like, yeah, do whatever you want, do your thing. So if this is any of you, like definitely let me know. Um, and another, just another quick example is that I was at Brook Park in the Bronx like two years ago and they have this big party called the Big Bronx Sanko Chaso um, that's with all these different organizations and stuff and it's a beautiful community garden that has a lot of history that I am not the one to tell it but I know that it is really strong. Um, and they had all of this sorghum growing and for anybody who knows anything about sorghum, it's not, it doesn't just grow like that in the North very often. Um, you don't see it around a lot, um, but sorghum is a, is a grain. And anyway, so there was all of this sorghum growing and I just was like, yo, like, is anyone gonna harvest this? So I, so I ended up harvesting it and we've been sharing it a lot with a lot of people and people are so excited. Um, but recently I was able to share it with a friend um, Jess, who is an herbalist and farmer, who was doing um, a course around like the history of sugarcane and uh, enslavement and just generally sweetness and sugar, and was trying to also offer like alternative sugars um, to people aside from white sugar and sugarcane. So I was able to give her a bunch of the sorghum seeds, which she then was able to process as a part of her class and like use and share with people as well. So also finding those like new ways and healing ways and um, yeah, people ed using education and the seeds as well for lots of different kinds of connections. But yeah, it's pretty fun. And if you have any seeds at your community garden, I'll come and harvest them. Okay, so the question was seed keeping story examples. Okay. Um, well, um, the, the Sea Keeping Fellowship Program is really um, just in its infancy. Um, so everybody's at like different stages. Um, some people came into the program knowing exactly what they wanted to grow and others um, have really taken some time to, to think about it and talk about it with me about what seeds they felt most closely connected to. Um, and then some things have been you know, a challenge to find, you know, if they are, if the seed is not already available uh, here in the U.S. if no one else is growing it and they have to be the first people to, to get that seed um, and steward it. And sometimes there's a language barrier when we're looking at these seeds from other countries. So with every, with every one of the seed keepers, it's, it's a completely different process. Um, to give one example, I, um, wanted to just relay a little bit of my relationship with one of our sea keepers who is uh, Jewish, um, uh, has a Ashkenazi Jewish heritage um, and Eastern European. And uh, she really uh, struggled at first to find a seed that she connected with. And I really related to her, um, to her struggle because we both come from, diasporic peoples and there's a lot of history of forced migration a lot of history of stories being lost of seeds being lost and trying to identify something that felt special to her I think uh, at first was a bit of a source of, of frustration and, and deepened the sense of loss of the of the of culture um, and so we focused around you know her family like what does her family eat um, what are the, the foods that they use around the Seder plate? And so we talked about that. Um, a lot of the plants that we ended up talking about were biennials, so they, they weren't a great fit for the this year's seed keeping program, or they were um, uh, plants that were propagated by um, tubers and, and roots and, and things that weren't propagated by seed that, you know, I told her we could experiment with, but also weren't a great fit for what we could offer this year. Um, but in that process of discovering, of talking about uh, what foods she ate, she ended up having a lot of conversations with family um, that sparked these conversations that hadn't been had. 
um, for a really long time around what their cultural foods were. And she came to start to piece together some other parts of her own story through understanding what seeds were kept and what seeds weren't. Um, you know, understanding about the necessity of, of you know, needing to, to move from place to place and the role that these storage crops played in the multiple migrations that her family had to undergo um, and things like that. Um, we did end up, um, finding a, a cucumber. She's growing a cucumber with us this year, um, a Polish variety that we were able to find, which is connected to her family, but we're also looking into um, some biennials for her uh, to plant, some herbs for her to, to plant to get her closer to her own cultural seed. But it, it really hasn't been about, um, for this particular seed keeper, finding like a specific Thing. Um, it's really been about that process of talking to her family, of finding other Jewish seed keepers and having those conversations that I think has made, um, has made it uh, a valuable experience, that, that, that process. And that, again, I, I really relate to you, um, that sometimes to find your, your seed keeping stories, you have to have those conversations with your family and reach back there. And that can sometimes um, do this, this extra work of, of healing, right? Especially when you come from diasporic and displaced communities. So that's, that's one example. Um, yeah, that's one example. Time check for Owen, it is 6.20. Great, uh, thank you. So there's a few more things I want to do in this conversation. Um, I would love to turn it to the focus on the community garden community a little bit with our the next couple of questions I want to ask um, all of us, you know, for whoever it's relevant, and it may be more relevant for Lex and Jeremy uh, about how people can get involved or interact um, with your projects. Uh, and I also would like all of us to give advice to, you know, community gardeners around how to get into this relationship with seeds that we're all a part of, if they are not already. And then I want us to be able to ask each other questions and then open it up to the people who are here with us to ask us questions. So everybody start thinking of your questions for each other. Um, and, uh, but let's do the first thing. I, I'd love for anyone for who it's whom it's relevant to say how people can get involved with our seed keeping projects. Um, I'll say from the True Love perspective, uh, you know, we, we work with East New York Farms and Red Hook Farms and also New Roots Farm in the Bronx um, as seed producers for our catalog. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm forgetting anybody. Uh, you know, we also have, you know, received seeds from people like Yemi from Oko Farms, who's from Nigeria, has sent us a bunch of Nigerian seeds to, because she wanted us to help steward them. Um, and so this year we have quite a few Nigerian seeds in our catalog because she was looking for a U.S. source for them. Um, also, one time I was walking around La Finca uh, Community Farm in the Bronx with Suzanne Babb and I uh, got some episote seeds that we now steward at the farm as well. You know, this year we were able to connect with a Nigerian farmer in um, Mississippi and she's gonna grow, take on some of those seeds. Our focus really is on people growing their own ancestral seeds. And so sometimes we will steward them until we find the right match. Um, and so we do accept, you know, if you're out there thinking, oh, I have this really important thing, there needs to be a source for it, we'd be happy to try to find a grower for it for the catalog or take it on until we find somebody. So those are some of the ways. If you're a community garden and you're thinking we're ready to grow some seeds for a seed company um, and you're focused on your own cultural and ancestral seeds, please reach out. And I'm going to pass it to other folks to see, you know, are there ways that people who are you know, here on this call with us can interact or get involved with your project. I can start. Um, so yeah, so Reclaim Seed NYC is, is obviously it's based here in the city and community gardens are definitely like some of the folks that we want to absolutely be making use of and connected with us and, and of service to. 
Um, and so there's a couple of ways that people could get involved if people want to get directly involved. Um, and also, like I said, um, in general, right, we want to like decentralize as much as possible. Um, we're trying to think more and more about what it looks like for us to not hold the seeds in one place. Um, and also, um, we are, uh, yeah, you know, Jackie and I are both humans going through life transitions. And so like, we're figuring things out, but there's definitely some, some ways to get involved. So one of the main things actually, um, is that we are looking for somebody, um, an individual or I guess small team or whatever, um, to steward the seed garden um, for the summer because um, we are, as I said, both, go both going through lots of life transitions and like have um, presence to it, but also know that it could be a great opportunity for someone else to um, kind of take some leadership in that and anyone who wants to steward just a couple of beds um, in Jamaica, Queens with a small stipend um, should definitely let me know. <laughs> um, and of course, as you know, as as Owen and, and everyone has been talking about, there is a commitment to us around like why why this is important, what you might want to steward, what you might be interested in growing and and um, and, you know, a deeper connection um, to to specific seeds. Um, so that's one real concrete thing. Um, and that would be really just a couple of hours a week, probably, maybe like one half day a week. It's like, it really, the maintenance depends, but it's in Jamaica, Queens. Um, and then another one of the things that we are um, thinking about is in kind of this like decentralization situation is um, the potential of like kind of satellite mini seed libraries in different places around the boroughs. Um, and so if you're interested, if you think that your community garden could be a host for like a mini seed library, um, and that could be, you know, hold like we, we have seeds that we can give, but also if that also includes like supporting y'all and sharing and supporting, supporting y'all and growing whatever you want to share with people as well. Um, that can, that can definitely be a part of that. Um, and so we're, we're just seeing if there's interest in that kind of thing so far. So if you, if your garden or someone else you might now be interested, also please let me know. And then I'll put a way to, yeah, I'll put a way to contact me in the chat. Um, and yeah, and then I think really in the fall is when we'll be doing um, seed saving workshops. So towards the end of the summer and fall, if you want to host us to do a workshop at your garden, we are here for that as well. Um, and yeah, as, a, as an educational thing, as a fun thing, as a whatever, as a seed exchange, as everything. Um, so yeah, we're, we're here. We're gonna be trying to take it like a little bit easy over the summer both of us, but we'll be, we'll be out here. And if people are interested in the mini libraries, we'll be working on that. Um, and I'll be supporting anyone who wants to kind of set, set their thing up. Um, and the kind of last thing I would say is like, we don't have a ton of time to, to do this right now over the summer, unfortunately, but, um, you know, as I said, a, a large part of what we do is the sharing of the stories that goes alongside the, 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 the seeds. Um, and so if there are people who are interested in that kind of story work and the gathering of stories and helping us to actually put together the archive that like mostly just lives in our heads, unfortunately, which is not how it's supposed to be forever. Um, please also, that is another opportunity, I would say, if anyone is interested in that kind of thing. Um, so I can also drop these like things in the chat so you can see them more easily because I did make a little note. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a couple of different ways. Um, so definitely let me know. And yeah. And also if anyone has other ideas too, we're, we're open. I can, um, go next, uh, with just a couple ways to connect with Greens Grows program. Um, again, it is in its infancy. So the best thing I can say is to stay tuned. Um, Greens Grow does have a social media account and the seed keepers are, um, will be posting their, their first blogs shortly. And so you can keep up with all of their, their progress. Um, we will have some workshops later in the summer, which will be open to the public if you're interested in attending any of those. Um, 
then you can check back on our social media for for when those are, are happening. Um, and we're, we hope also to have a couple of community events around seed keeping. Um, you know, the program is designed to be in part uh, uh, cultivated by the seed keeper interests and their, their uh, different um, artistic expressions and ways of connecting with their community. So um, as they as they come into their own as seed keepers, we'll have more events uh, that we'll share with you um, and we're also, one of the goals of the program is to start a community seed library. Um, so stay tuned for that as well. Yeah, um, in terms of getting involved with East New York Farms, I'm definitely open to collaboration or suggestion. I think um, if people, I mean, one thing is that if people want seeds from East New York Farms, you can always get in touch with us. We had one seed giveaway um, earlier this spring, but I think it would be great to have sort of an ongoing um, kind of rolling seed giveaway throughout the season for sure. Um, and it's, I definitely want to incorporate more of the seeds that we've saved. Kind of typically what we've done in the past is that we do get a bunch of seed donations from companies and, and that's typically what we give away officially. Um, and part of it is like, are the, the quantity of seed that I've been able to save for some things I've been, somewhat small. So um, if anybody wants to help save some seed, you know, grow out some of the crops that we grow, like growing out some long beans or some of the peppers that we grow, um, it would be amazing to have a network of people that are growing some of these things um, and like kind of pooling our resources together and then sharing them back out with people. So I'd be happy if anybody has an interest in growing some of the seed crops that um, I mentioned, and there are others too. I can definitely give people some seeds to get started. Um, yeah, those are the those are the things that I'm thinking of at the moment. Oh, I, I love what this is becoming, and it's reminding me of a lot of other things that I want to ask you all to help with. Um, so, if we are, you know, we're in Philly, um, but we have three peppers that need people to grow them isolated 100 feet from other peppers. So if you're interested in producing seeds for peppers and you're able to get them from Philly and you're watching and you can do it really soon, we need growers for three. One of them is the ahi dulce. So maybe there'll be enough from a new program. Okay, good. That's what I was, gonna, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Another one is the Pippin's Golden Honey from Horace Pippin. So it's an African-American heirloom. I actually don't love the pepper, but people love to buy it and love to grow it because of the history. So we're looking for someone to steward that one. And then there's a, another um, Piri Piri uh, pepper, which is an African diasporic pepper that we're looking for growers for. Um, I also, we run a seed exchange here in Philadelphia um, that I've been running for the last five or six years. And we just had a swap a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, and we're trying to have another one in the summer. So if you're in the Philly area or want to come visit your neighbors down here, um, we're called the Philadelphia Seed Exchange. Uh, and we'll probably have another one in early summer. So please come meet your Philly counterparts um, and join us at that. Uh, I want to spend a quick moment just well, first, as, as uh, Mara mentioned in the comments, this, you know, there's, we did one workshop a couple weeks ago with Julia Aguilar, one of our coworkers at True Love Seeds, and myself on how to plan your gardens for seed saving. So if you're thinking, okay, I'm ready, I want to do it, but I don't know, you know, how to, how to do it, that conversation is on the Green Thumb YouTube page. And then our next one is with Zainab Mohammed, who's one of our other coworkers here at True Love and myself, and we'll be talking about how to save seeds from wet and dry crops. And that'll also be in this series and then on the YouTube station. Um, so, but I'd love for all of us to just give a tip or two to people who are community gardeners who want to get into saving or keeping their own seeds. Um, and it's a, that's a unique context uh, to be doing this in a community garden since there are special considerations. Um, oh, hey, Debbie, thank you. I see your, I see your note. I'm so glad you're here. 
uh, I will definitely reach out. Um, so let's let's talk though. This is a good example. So Debbie, my friend Debbie, just made a comment that they will grow. She will grow in the garden. Uh, he will say there's considerations around uh, you know isolation, distance, selection. So let's. Can I hear from the panelists any any tips you want to give to community gardeners um, that is encouraging and inspiring, um, but also you know explain some of the realities of it. Let's start with Amira. <laughs> I was so sure you were gonna call in Jeremy. Okay. <laughs> um, well, th I think there's a, a tremendous amount of resources for you. I think there's a lot of great free resources um, through, you know, the, the, the Green Thumb YouTube, um, and there's also a lot of resources online. I know Seed Savers Exchange is amazing resources if you're interested in growing. And what's great about those is they are also, um, they have resources that are really tailored to community gardeners and smaller scale. So you don't have to get overwhelmed by the information around, you know, seed saving at like a really hundred acre farm scale. Um, so there's there's a lot of resources out there. It, seed saving can be really technical um, if you want it to be. Um, but then the other thing I think you have to remember about seed keeping is that we've been doing it since the beginning of civilization, that seed keeping is as old as civilization. It's older even, um, and our, our ancestors did it and, and so can you. You know, you can, you can do it in a really scientific, complicated way. And I, I personally love to nerd all over the science of seed keeping, but you don't have to. Um, there's a lot of resources for getting started. You don't need to use a lot of, of money resources to get started. You can really um, scrap through it uh, with a little bit, with a little bit of, of knowledge. I think um, it's, it's one of the most accessible, accessible things that you that you can do um, you know you can do it at any age you can do it intergenerationally and just keep in mind it only has to be as complicated or as complex as you as you want it to be you know if you're growing from a for a seed company versus if you're growing for yourself and your family it really doesn't need to be that hard so I guess to sum that up there are resources all around you available to you use them but also don't get bogged down in them yeah, I'll just jump in. As one of the people who's on the very less like scientific side of the spectrum, um, definitely I'm hearing Amira say, just go for it, um, which for sure, you know, I would say I, I still consider myself to be like a beginner grower. I'm actually in farm school right now. And I already know that like seeds are my heart, you know, it's like, it's not even about that, but you know, it's also about learning. It's about learning so much. Actually, that would be one piece of advice, prepare to learn <laughs> um, because it's a humbling journey. Um, and you definitely, you'd like both like inherently know what to do and also like very much have everything to learn at the same time. Um, the other, the only other thing I would say is like, um, yeah, as Owen said, obviously, distance in a community garden is complicated and also there might be a community garden on the other side of the block and like that still is not yeah books I mean, I was showing some books that are the seed garden and seed to seed those are both really helpful um and yeah I would just say um pick one that would be start with one um and yeah, and, and really give, give yourself and your presence and your focus to that one. Um, and in terms of the community garden context, like if y'all can all pick one together, that's amazing. Um, that's beautiful. I have seen a community garden come together around seeds, you know, where it's sometimes hard to get people to. Um, but if you can pick one or two as a garden, that, that's really special. And I would love to hear that story and I would love to support y'all if you do. So please let us know, yeah. Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, obviously if you're saving seed and you have a really specific variety that you're trying to preserve in its exact form, that's one thing. But um, if 
that's not a requirement and you want to j more just get your feet wet with saving seed, then just don't worry about varieties getting mixed a little bit, especially if there are um, varieties of crops that you know that you can get the um, the seed for again from another seed company. Like, a, you know, if you want to try saving seed from like a kale plant, right? And you're, you think, well, the lacinato and the curly kale might mix, but you know that you can find lacinato kale again if you need to, but you just are doing it to experiment. Like, I would say just go for it. Um, and you might find that you get seeds that come true to type anyway. I mean, Owen and I have talked a lot about this, how ba how baffling, baffling it is um, for the fact that we grow probably around 20 varieties of hot and seasoning peppers at my farm, and I don't isolate them at all. And for the most part, we don't see a lot of crossing happening, and we're able to keep the seeds relatively um, you know, keep the varieties relatively distinct. You know, it seems like, I mean, and this is sort of anecdotal, but David once told me that he thinks like between like planting them, harvesting them, like seeds getting mixed up in envelopes, you know, that kind of thing, that there's more room for error there than what happens with cross-pollination. But I'm, I'm mostly finding that we're able to keep these um, varieties really, I mean, and honestly, they get better than, every year I'm always amazed by how well our peppers grow. Um, so yeah, that's my, those are my words of encouragement and inspiration is just not to worry about, about um, varieties crossing so much if you can, unless it's a variety that you are like, it's precious to you that you can't get anywhere else. I, I love the idea that Lex brought up. I just wanted to say of, of a community garden picking a seed to steward together, I would really, it would be so amazing if that was something that came out of this conversation. If you're here with a bunch of your fellow community gardeners, I just had to say that. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love this conversation. Thank you all so much for everything that you're, that you're saying. Um, I would love to open it to you three, because I remember when we were planning this, we thought it might be nice just to have a conversation and be able to ask each other questions. Um, so do any of you have a question for the rest of us uh, in terms of panelists asking panelists? And then we'll open it up to the group to ask questions of us. Yeah, I have one um, for everyone. Um, let me see how I wanna ask this. I know that's important to all three of you to um, both have like your own relationship to seeds and your own seed keeping practice, as well as to share the knowledge with others and to teach. Um, and I just would love to like ask about that and ask about kind of like how you balance in that relationship, how you have your own relationship while also sharing the, the knowledge and the wealth of the seeds with the people. or also like why both are important to you or how both are important to you or any of that? Um, you know, when I, when I first started uh, as a seed keeper, it really was all about my own personal experience. I really came in um, just, you know, so focused on my, my own cultural crops. Um, and it still is, it still is my heart and soul. <laughs> But, um, you know, actually, Owen, it was through working with you and seeing the work that, that True Love was doing with all of our growers um, that I really started to want to bring this to other people, for everybody else to have that experience that I was having of, of connection and, and having those conversations that we had on the farm where everybody's sharing their seed stories. Um, I just have become so special to me. And some of my favorite uh, moments have come out of when either myself and, and someone else or, or, or two, two other people um, from two you know, very different backgrounds are talking about their, their cultural seeds and they're talking about the same seed. And they're talking about how this plant is special to each of them in different ways from, from different pathways. Um, and that they share this, this connection that almost makes them like family um, through this, this seed that they share. Um, and I, I, uh, those, are, those are some of the most special 
moments for me, you know, when I can, you know, connect one of my seed keepers to another one and say, hey, you know, you, you have this um, Afro-Caribbean heritage and you have this Southeast Asian heritage and you're both stewarding the same crop together. Um, and this, it, it's such a special moment, you know, you can share those, um, those different um, cross-cultural connections through, through the work and have those conversations and, and to realize that something that's special to you is, is not yours alone. Um, so I, you know, both are, both are important. That's a really good question. I'm gonna to try to be concise because it's making me think of a lot of things all at once. First, you know, growing my own Southern Italian and, and Irish crops has been so deeply powerful to me and really was at the urging of honestly, many of my black friends, my black partner being like, what are you bringing to the literal table? You know, in these cultural conversations, you're in the, the social justice, this food movement you know, we're all about making social change. You're working in Black communities. What's your story? You know, and so to be focused on my own ancestors has been so healing, you know, to heal the, the loss that comes from assimilation into, you know, a place of power, a place of whiteness, you know, is the loss of language, culture, religion, you know, traditions. And so to reclaim that through seed saving has been so deeply powerful and has allowed me to connect with people, like you're saying, Amira, who share the same food ways from different places, um, to be able to be like, oh, we, we actually eat this West African crop or this indigenous American crop and it's Italian, you know, is so powerful. But I think what I'm more excited about in your question is why teaching? And it really has its roots in my work in, with community gardens in New York City, and it's hard to articulate, but when I was hired with, you know, at Just Food, Kathleen McTeague, who hired me, said, you're not doing your job if you're not spending half your time sitting under the tree in a community garden with an elder, just hearing about their life and sharing, you know, about your life and building a meaningful relationship. You're not here to do, to be efficient. You're not here to do X, Y, and Z. You're here to build relationships because that's the movement that we're building. You know, we're not, we're, we're here to actually have genuine relationships with community gardeners because that's our work and then to teach the training of trainers through just food and learning about popular education where you're in a classroom space but instead of teaching from a top-down place you're actually encouraging people to share deeply about their lives so you know the, these two were modalities for like building a movement and building a community amongst community gardeners hearing deeply about their lives and sharing deeply about your life and so what is, when I started um, learning about seeds from Dr. Weaver, my mentor, um, and I became passionate about it and realized it was my life's work and had to bring it back to the food justice movement, um, I realized that this is the deepest story you can hear from somebody, is their food story, their seed story. You know, what speaks not just to their own tastes, but to their tastes of a home that they've left, you know, to their ancestors. Um, the seed story is one of the most personal and deepest stories you can share with a person and you can eat it and taste it and you can feel it and you can help share, you know, preserve that story as well. And so for me, sharing that as a way of connecting and building community, just that whole idea of connecting with people, you know, through their seed stories, um, deepened that whole concept of sitting in the community garden with the elder and creating a teaching space where people are sharing um, their experience with whatever the subject matter is as a way of deeply connecting with it and making it their own. Um, and so for me, it just was a continuation and uh, you know, going in further into that, that work um, within the food justice movement um, and a way to connect with elders. I just love elders. Um, you know, a lot of the people we work with are not elders, but it requires us, like Amira was saying, to talk to our elders, you know, and acknowledge our elders and acknowledge the people that came before us. Um, so that was my attempt at concisely answering that question. Yeah, I think that the other thing that I'm hearing, or Jeremy, if you want to add, please do, but I'll just say the other oh, thing that I'm hearing is that maybe, I don't know, 
that like you it's like you have to have this on your own relationship in order to help people have their own relationships right it's like this is all this is all super connected so um yeah really appreciate really appreciate hearing that have any of you read braiding sweetgrass um there's a there was one that book is probably one of my favorite books of all time I mean, I'm not the most well-read person, but of the books that I have read, anyway, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer talks in one part about, I, I hope I'm getting this right, because I read it like four years ago at this point. I believe the phrase she uses is becoming indigenous to place. Does this ring a bell for either of you? Any of you, rather? Um, and what I got out of it was that, you know, in, in America, in Turtle Island, however you want to call it, it's like, so many of us are, most of us are immigrants and most of us are not indigenous to this land. And a lot of us have lost connections to the land that we are indigenous to. And I certainly feel that way. Like my family is Ashkenazi Jewish and we've been in New York City for four generations, you know, and so if I'm indigenous to any place, it is New York City at this point, um, as far as I can tell. So, you know, I know, part of my journey is just like reckoning with the fact that I don't have ancestors that I can ask, you know, what, you know, I don't know who, if anyone in my family was a farmer or what seeds that they grew or what crops they grew. Um, and so I'm sort of, I don't want to say starting from scratch, but I'm just trying to figure out like what, not only being tied to the past, but trying to understand like in our present society in our present community here like what can we grow together and what can we um make in like like what can we um i don't know how to put this like what can we start having relationships with that as that can be the start of a new kind of like lineage of of passing down to our future you know to to, to um the generations to come um so yeah, like I don't have that story of like um, crops from a particular place that mean a lot to me, but for me it's more just the act of seed saving itself that I find really nourishing and that I imagine a lot of people all across place and time have found nourishing. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm more interested in less in like imparting wisdom on people and more just in like trying to be co-collaborators and dreamers together. Yeah. That's that's beautiful. Yeah, on one hand, I mean, I always say that a seed story has to start somewhere, you know? Like, it's great when we can go 10,000 years into the past of the origin of agriculture and tell that seed story. But we, a lot of our seed stories start really recently and we're creating them ourselves as well. I mean, we can always honor the first people who um, cultivated that species in our seed story, but a lot of seed stories take bends and turns um, and start with somebody, um, a, a new a new story. So, I mean, like your pumpkin, you know, like <laughs> we can talk about who bred the butternut and, and talk all about Jamaican pumpkins and Caribbean pumpkins in general. And that's an important part of that story. And then there's a bend in the story with you um and Marlene and Dennis in East New York um so it's important to acknowledge all those things and and also realize we're always creating the future in what we're doing that's One beautiful day be the ancestor mm -hmm. yeah and the other thing is I mean Amira mentioned it earlier working with her you know fellow who's also Ashkenazi Jewish you know I I learned recently that I also have significantly Ashkenazi Jewish, and I don't claim that heritage because I wasn't raised with it, but it's difficult for a lot of the Ashkenazi Jewish people that I've spoken with to reconcile with the loss of seed culture uh, and farming culture, and um, and it's a real it's a real real question, and and, I, and there's I'm part of an email group that maybe if you're interested I can connect you with with Ashkenazi Jewish seed companies and seed producers trying to reckon with that question too um you know because it's there's seeds from the you know ancestral seeds from the middle east there's seeds from eastern europe 
it's just a complicated story. And then there's the fact that so many Ashkenazi Jew, Jewish people have not been connected to the land for many generations for various reasons. So it's, it's not easy for everybody to latch on to an immediate story. Um, and that's, that's part of the work. So, yeah, I'm wondering, well, I'd love to hear a response if you have one, but I'd also love to see if there's any questions from um, the, the, um, the participants. Yes, other questions, yes. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. Um, this is a really beautiful panel, and I'm really thrilled that y'all were able to be here tonight and share this and have such a fun and invigorating conversation. So much information. There haven't been questions in the chat that were specifically related to um, the, the panel. We did have like a crop planning question that I answered in the chat um, and pointed that person to some resources. But folks, we have seven minutes left. So if you have any questions at all for our panelists, now is the time. And I encourage you to speak up in the chat um, while we still have time with these folks. And Lex put in the chat that I probably have lots of thoughts about Jews and plants and I do, and it took me forever to get there. <laughs> I, used to, I used to laugh at the question, like, <laughs> When did we, when were we allowed to own land? Like, when did that happen? Um, but it took me a long time to, to come around and to understand that there are, there are some great resources and stories and histories to, to learn about. Yeah, and, and that's, all, that's all to say the, his, the history of Jews and Ashkenazi Jews in particular and plants is obviously really complicated and as the thing that Mary just said about when we own like it's like you have to know history like you have to be a student of history in some ways to like really understand where these seeds come how they travel how they don't how where they stop like which is my whole thing which I'm totally obsessed with but I think also like I don't know y'all can also probably speak to like you have to like both like like ask questions and wh whether that's just the elder under the tree or like some other form of research right because it's all relevant or and or right like there's a lot of um other pieces about well well then why did jews have this relationship to the land like how does whiteness like just like you have to be in all those questions all at once which are a lot um so and I will as, say all, yeah oh, sorry go ahead go ahead Mara. i will say also just for the green thumb gardeners that um we had planned with Lex and Owen for the 2020 Grow Together, we had planned this gigantic seed exchange that was gonna have like the entire top four of the conference. And then we had to cancel it because of COVID. And so these are some you know, things that we are thinking about and working on and would love your ideas around um, what your community garden needs, ideas, dreams, visions about things that Green Thumb can help support with in the future are also, I would also love to hear more about those. And y'all know how to reach me because I send out a lot of emails. Any other questions, either from the audience or from our panelists? At some point, and, and maybe not maybe not tonight, but at some point, I would love to learn from those of you who are um, studied in history about that process of, of, of digging in um, and, and, and doing that research, because that's an area where I think um, I'm not incredibly learned. We have a great question in the class in the chat. Um, I'd love to know more about native seeds. Mm. Can anyone speak to that? Can you clarify what you mean by native seeds? <laughs> it's like native uh, wild plants or, or indigenous vegetable and herb varieties. Because those are two different questions. Indigenous veg. Well, I'll, I'll say that we, um, we are in relationship to a bunch of indigenous seed keepers um, who kind of taught us a true love quite a bit. Uh, we, we, I also got a lot of Lenape 
since both of our cities are on Lenape land, uh, we got a lot of Lenape seeds from my mentor's collection. Um, and one thing I've learned from, you know, some of my friends and elders in various indigenous communities is kind of the importance of the rematriation of varieties that have been kept by private collections, museums, you know, uh, and so on. And so part of our work is to, we grow out a lot of Lenape corn and bean varieties uh, at True Love, partially to rematriate them to individuals and tribes uh, who request them. Um, and so, and we also keep aside a percentage of our sales from any indigenous varieties to send to those respective tribes, um, which is something, a movement that's happening throughout kind of the small scale seed world, uh, kind of pushed forward by Rowan White, a Mohawk seed keeper, um, who's been a part of the kind of small seed company world for 20 years um, and is kind of organizing amongst seed companies to do that work of both rematriation telling the truth, the full story of these seeds, you know, the origins, the first people who kept them and making sure that, um, that these, these tribes are also benefiting financially from any sales of their traditional varieties. And of course, not including anything in, in seed catalogs that are sacred or shouldn't, that shouldn't be commercialized. So those are some of the things, some of the ways we approach those issues. Thank you. And thank you, Lex, for putting a link to um, putting several links in the chat. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Owen, for sharing that. We had one more question and we have one more minute. Um, I once read that if you wanted to stop cross-pollination, you had to cover up plants on a schedule, like each day a different group is uncovered for bees to go to and at the end of the day is covered again. Is that true or successful? Um, and Amira started with depends on the plant, but does anyone else have comments? I think that question, um, it's getting into a, a really uh, complicated technique um, that, I, that I don't think we have time to like fully cover, but uh, I, the shorter long answer is um, that it, it really depends on how that plant is pollinated um, and what its um, flowering schedule looks like, um, but alternate day, um, alternate day isolation is a strategy that, that some people do use. Um, I haven't personally used it. It's something I'm actually considering experimenting with this year um, for some of our, our crops that we have. Um, so I haven't done alternate day caging, um, but it is something that can work, but it really just depends on you know, an individual plant, how it's pollinated and, and what, it's, what its flowering schedule is like. Thank you, Amira. And thank you, Owen, for moderating such a great panel. Thank you to all the panelists for being with us tonight. Super, super inspiring hearing from all of you. I love hearing how, you know, New York growers and Philly growers are intertwined and working with each other and in their local networks and hearing um, about all the different ways that folks can get involved within their own community gardens all the way up to these larger projects. So thank you so much for sharing everything tonight. It was really great having you. Um, and I look forward to seeing everyone again in person someday. <laughs> and in the meantime, please stay healthy, please stay safe, um, and have a really great growing season. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, everyone. Please hit me up if you're interested in stuff with Reclaim Seed NYC.